I'm Dr. Leanna Wolf, and I'm also a last minute ad in this topic. The talk I'm giving tomorrow was planned way in advance. But um, this is negotiating pair bonding, romantic love, and jealousy in polyamorous relationships. And I was asked to fill in on jealousy. So start out with some definitions. There's the grand big category of polygamy. I'm an anthropologist as well as a sexologist, so I will be talking a little bit about my research in other cultures as well as my research here in the Western world. Um, polygyny is a lot more common in non-Western cultures than polyandry is, something like 85 or 84.5% of cultures might have a man with multiple wives and only 0.5% of cultures will have a woman with multiple husbands. Basically, an anthropologist discusses monogamy simply in terms of having one spouse, and this is not anything to do with popular parlance about monogamy referring to sexual exclusivity. And serial monogamy, you heard this discussed before, and very common mating pattern for Westerners. And swingers basically also have one spouse, and it's just handled through multiple play playmates. So they can still have a legally monogamous marriage in terms of property and things like that. And you guys, we all know too much about polyamory already. <laughs> so as an anthropologist, some of the way I um, understand a culture is by the language that's used. And so compersion is a really important concept for poly people. And as is new relationship energy. And um, there's other terms trying to quantify and qualify who's who, like OSOs and metamors, and the notion of social hierarchy that was well discussed before, and um, the dream that some families have of polyfidelity. So to me, the hallmark of polyamory is this appetite for disclosure. Not the appetite for multiple partners, because um, we've already heard that that can be expressed in many different ways, but people who want to hear, want to share, and um, find safety or generate safety in knowing. And also having a positive regard for a partner's extra relationship erotic and emotional connections. I teach anthropology, and I always talk to my students a bit about this in every class, and especially a lot in my gender, sex, and culture classes, and I encourage my students to do survey research. And so one of my students did a compersion-type survey with her Facebook friends as her primary respondents, and nobody was compersive. <laughs> this is an acquired taste. Uh, so cultural conventions, embracing the idea of polyculture, um, managing jealousy, thinking of jealousy as something that can be managed, taking jealousy management workshops, reading about it, believing it's possible, and of course the compersion, and the NRE management, saying, oh yeah, if I'm in that thick phase of being overwhelmed with someone else, my partner will understand, and vice versa, and knowing, and oh, NRE, I'm sorry, and we'll talk more about it, is new relationship energy. Okay, so it's the, that excited phase where you really would rather be with one person, and here you are managing it and being poly. There you go. <laughs> Better. And of course, this whole issue with um, disclosure of um, attempting to be transparent or saying you really are, saying everything and having a consensuality about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So cultural practices. New partners are incorporated for novelty, not to replace or displace long-term ones. Totally different than serial monogamy. And disinterest in having just one. And back to the NRE topic. NRE is reviewed, reviewed as a temporary state. 
and not a reason to disrupt one's <coughs> home life. And so basically people do everything they can to not get into roller coasters of being just wanting to be with one and wanting to go, get full of fantasy and anxiety over a new love. So our configurations. The most common ones are an open couple. And um, Ryan had much more detail about different types of open couples and poly singles. Um, and certainly within open couples, there could be primary and secondaries or multiple primaries. And then um, there's Vs and full on triads, rarely quads, and certainly all kinds of intimate networks. So how being in a poly relationship feels? Well, there's a high demand for honesty. And um, there's all kinds of things going on with versus if you're primary or secondary or incidental. And then there's challenges of having multiple primaries, everything from logistics to communication to respect. And there's also the challenge of um, not feeling like anyone's primary and the possibility of having multiple statuses. And this is like probably the, the best part in terms of um, being um, both a, a, having, being a, a, a positional primary because of living with someone and then having an NRE state with someone else. So you get a little bit of everything. Um, so one consideration, is it possible to be happy with polyamory and to not feel like a favorite or to not have a primary status? So who are the poly players? We, we all heard about how many Caucasians we still have doing this and how well educated <laughs> they are. And there's a whole sect of them that um, look to science fiction for their role models. There's people who began as swingers and then said, no, we really like these people. We want to see a lot of them. And then there's people who tried monogamy, just couldn't do it. And then there's just these idealistic people who think you really can. So um, one of the things we look at in anthropology are reproductive set strategies in terms of why people engage who they engage the way they do. Many of you have probably heard of David Buss and his theory of the sexy son hypothesis. And basically what goes on here is that um, women might be mating with multiple men to get the best of both worlds. They might be partnered with somebody with resources and status and at mid-cycle they may unconsciously slip off and find a hunk and get pregnant by him and then their child is both gorgeous and wealthy and thus can take her genes into the next generation. Good move. And <laughs> And then there's partable paternity. And this is mostly an Amazonian practice. A bunch of tribes like the Canela and the Ache and the Bari do this. And it's a really cool strategy. Basically, once the woman becomes, um, women are always regarded as a little pregnant. And as a woman is more pregnant, she um, has multiple men visiting her. And they, um, and they believe that it takes many washings of semen to build a fetus into a baby. And thus she has to have a lot of sex throughout her pregnancy. And if the sex she's having is with different guys, each of their characteristics are going to be seen in the baby. And this is a really interesting understanding of biology maybe not accurate in terms of what you studied in Bio 101, but it's culturally great because all the men care about the woman, bring her food, cause her to get better nutrition during her pregnancy, and ultimately once the baby is born, it's a healthier baby, and all the men think they're the daddy, and they all help out. And then there's the practice of serial monogamy. Helen Fisher basically says this is what humans do. And that 
the way there's multiple partners in it is, is that people um, go through cycles and they basically, you could be with one person and as a kind of insurance, you'll have somebody in the wings and then ultimately brain chemistries will shift if this isn't a well-fortified relationship with lots of kids and you're of the age where you are likely to want to break up and meet someone new, so you'll get divorced and then ultimately remarried or repartnered if you don't do marriage. And of course there's um, polygamy and as we noted, um, many, many cultures practice this in terms of just the world as a whole, about 30% of the world population lives in a community where polygamy is practiced. And largely it's polygyny and it's typically about 20% of the men in those communities can afford more wives and all the children that will come of that. So um, pair bonding. So basically, you know, Helen Fisher is talking about how pair bonding is what humans do. We find someone, we get excited about them, and we want to go for it. We had a couple of intentional communities, the Oneida community in the mid-19th century and the Carista community across the Bay in San Francisco in the um, 70s into the beginning in the 70s going on for about 25 years and they basically um, said we um, can't allow pair bonding this is going to break up our group and so instead they focused on what they called starling brothers and sisters so the lovers of your lovers and you were all to have relationships with everyone and Again, a discouragement of getting too excited about one person. It's more the idea was the group, not a single person. So we've been referring to these stages of romantic love. So let's take a look. So lust is um, powered by testosterone, and it's basically um, you can lust after anybody. They can be a rock star. They can um, be a really good blogger. I don't know, anyone, and you don't have to ever meet them. And then there's attraction, and this is the NRE thing. And this is where your brain gets full of dopamine and norepinephrine, and you can get lovesick. And basically, the, some people have to be treated medically for this con condition. And some of my students suffer in this condition if their texts aren't responded to really, really fast. You need a lot of affirmation. Attachment is you finally got through this. And your stable primary hormones are oxytocin and vasopressin. You, your partnership is working. It's not as exciting, but it's stabilized. Now, what's interesting in terms of our Western world is we think this is a really important phase. And we think you have to act like this to assure the health of your relationship, where um, most of the um, non-Western world would just say, this is how adults have their relationships. I remember I was in Uganda during Valentine's Day, and they, <laughs> there was some talk on the radio about how you should celebrate and give your um, husband or wife a card or flowers and they were saying this is whole marketization we don't need this in africa we know we where we are but so many westerners feel there's something really wrong if this isn't celebrated and then there's detachment <coughs> sometimes many times it doesn't work out maybe it's the, the the way we get into marriages and relationships that make this a problem. Certainly, the cultures that have arranged marriages have really different expectations in terms of romantic love, and their marriages don't fall apart because the, the stages wind down and somebody's feeling really empty. So, um, basically, in terms of brain chemistry, Romantic love, 
the attraction phase, um, raises dopamine and norepinephrineism, norepinephrine levels, and the outcome is um, obsession, um, possessiveness, mate guarding, and the need to be the favorite and be with the favorite. And basically, if you have high serotonin levels, this can inoculate against this craziness. And there's not as much need for confirmation of, romant of mutual love. And, I, and it's like, I, as I used to study this a lot and ponder over, well, why is it? And why am I so crappy at this? And basically, I realized I just didn't have high serotonin. I needed all this stuff. And I was a really bad poly. <laughs> 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 and so um, the question I would raise is, is it possible to be in love with more than one sweetie? Well, you could lust after a lot of people. And you could um, be in the attachment phase where you just sort of settled and OK with lots of people. But that attraction phase, I think, is largely a mono experience, unless you just happen to fall in love with a couple. And then, yeah, you can be the attraction with both of them. So um, as for romantic love, it's really a human universal. It's found all over the world. When we've, anthropologists have studied different cultures, we've noted that everyone notices the difference between the attraction phase and the <coughs> attachment phase. We just, as I said before, put a lot of credence on the attraction phase. And um, yeah, could be suicidal. And certainly, this is the phase you would get the most jealous in. So we're going to talk about jealousy. Sex, love, jealousy. So um, the biological roots are a man fearing being deceived into raising a non-biological child. So here he is putting his energy and resources and time in raising a child that isn't his genetic spawn. And um, at the same time, there's been observations that it could be culturally learned. And there's cultures where it doesn't seem to be present. And then certainly there's economic considerations <coughs> where a, a female would fear that her partner's time, energy, and resources might be directed outside of their home and their children, and thus um, she and her children will suffer. So lots of different kinds of jealousy. This possessiveness jealousy is typically an NRE type thing. Um, there's exclusion jealousy, feeling left out, deprived of time and attention. There's competition jealousy, feeling inadequate comparing oneself to others. There's ego jealousy, feeling that others will judge you for sharing a lover like you couldn't have one all for yourself. And um, there's fear jealousy, the anxiety that your partner will leave permanently. So in terms of monogamy, <coughs> jealousy is a sign of true love. And um, ultimately, we see it in terms of divorce, where there's big financial penalties um, once the relationship falls apart. And basically, jealousy is going to occur when displacement or replacement <coughs> is feared. And certainly, that's the standard outcome in a monogamous culture. So I managed to study polygyny in a number of different cultures in the world. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about um, Africa and New Guinea. Um, and it occurs when resources aren't divided evenly. And so when a man in, amongst um, some of the tribes I visited in East Africa um, receives resources, he has to lay it out evenly so each wife sees that the other ones are getting the same amount. 
And it can also happen in when visiting times are unequal. There was a story amongst um, some of the people I lived with where one of the wives kept the husband too many nights because they were on a rotating schedule. And she came over and attacked the man, the, oh, the other wife, and first with pots, and then it escalated to knives, and then they both ended up in the hospital. So it's really important to keep things even. <laughs> and, um, or when it looks like one wife is more the favorite and that actually matters. Or when it's not chosen by the wives. So sometimes a wife will get into a relationship that she thinks or she was told is going to be monogamous and suddenly her husband declares, hey, well, I never said it was going to be monogamous and that's when there's problems. So here I am um, doing research with the Luo in Western Kenya. And here I am doing research with the Huli in Papua New Guinea. I've done other research too. So amongst these peoples, there's different residence patterns. The Luo have a circular hut. The Maasai have huts as well. Um, in New Guinea, they sleep separately. The women are in their own residence and men sleep with other men in the men's house. And Mormons, like on all the TV shows you guys might be watching, um, separate households or main house with adjacent trailers. So here's the Luo compound. Husband's hut is in the center. His first wife is here, his other wives. And his mother is here, very important, because every woman who has a good son um, has a place to live when um, she grows older. He's her social security because all these wives help him out and she helps with babysitting. And then it's much um, easier for a woman to marry at a young age than a man. A man needs resources to marry, so here's all the unmarried sons. And then there are two entrances. Main entrance for all kinds of visitors and private entrance for secret visitors to these women helping them produce a son, in case this husband isn't able to do it. And here's a Maasai compound. The, here they just have two huts. The husband just rotates between the two. Fortunately, I never lived with them. I just visited them, because they also keep a cow in the hut <laughs> and smoking fires all the time. The Lua were much more palatable. They. Um, had their cooking hut separate from their sleeping hut. <coughs> there is a Maasai triad. So he just rotates between these two. And here's a Huli men's house. Now, this is in New Guinea. And so why do the Huli um, men sleep separate? Well, their tradition was that women are polluting and if a man is around menstrual blood, he could get very weakened. <coughs> so best thing is to stay out of women's spaces because you never know. So many of them will never leave the village because if they went into a city and ended up in a hospital, there could be a woman on the rag and the guy would fall apart. So um, from men from six years on, sleep with the men, cook with the men, <coughs> stay safe. This is a model of a woman's a co-wife's house. The men would build it for the women, but then that's it. Then they would never step inside because you never know. Bad fluids. And here's a sweet potato garden. Why am I showing you that? So this, I, I lived there long enough to ask the big question of where do you guys have sex? And they said in the afternoon in the sweet potato garden. So you go. <laughs> and there is some very phallic looking sweet potatoes. OK, so favoritism. So typically, whoever is new is typically the favorite. Hi, and that's where the NRE kicks in. So um, basically, how is it managed in Africa? Well, every wife has a status. She could be a first wife. She could be a traveling wife. She could be the, the newest wife. She could be um, the 
I, there's so everyone is something, so no one is just leaving. They all are valuable. And the Mormons have some really interesting things going on. I have a colleague who does research amongst the um, Mormons in um, Arizona. And he was, he has uncovered that um, women so see value in being in a new marriage that they will leave a marriage they're in to be in a new marriage because if they're in a new marriage they can be a favorite and favorites have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Typically in Africa their view is, is you're only favorite for a little while and then your husband will find another wife. So considering that situation, you um, basically view it like Miss America. One year you're Miss America and you wear the crown, and the rest of the time you're form former Miss America. And so you still have the status of being married to the guy. He's still your husband. So, so basically favoritism is gonna be irrelevant when resources are shared fairly. And so there was this joke that Africans told me in Kenya where when a man has a lot of wives and he visits some of his friends, he goes, sits way in the back of the house so that if somebody comes to the door and says your wife needs help, he has time to figure out which wife it is. <laughs> um, and certainly it's going to be irrelevant if a second wife doesn't displace a first one. Um, and so basically, as we said, newest wives are favorites only until a subsequent one is added. And if you're not a favorite, you shrug it off because she's not going to be there that long anyway. <laughs> so we've mentioned swinging a little bit. So it limits jealousy because there's not elaborate seduction and social and legal monogamy are preserved and um, basically Safer sex can be both viral as well as emotional, not getting connected. And I've even spoken to swingers who would say, I would never sleep with somebody I'm super attracted with because that could be really disruptive. So we have some of the mothers of polyamory giving advice on polyamory and jealousy, personal growth to transform into no longer being jealous, um, a more advanced form of relationship to evolve beyond monogamy, and you can change the way you experience jealousy. Obviously, you've got to be motivated. Um, so I came up with this term of polyarmory. <laughs> you can only imagine. So basically, you're trying to retain your status and security by imposing all kinds of rules. Um, so needing partner approval, um, E-I-E-G, don't get involved with somebody who has a monogamy agenda, scheduled visits, don't surprise me, don't surprise me, and approved activities. Like you can do this, but you can't do that. You can do this on Thursday, but not on Sunday whatever it is to retain safety and security and the same kinds of things people in monogamy require. So I did this um, study on polyamory and je jealousy a really long time ago, and um, this was towards my doctoral dissertation. And this was the days before there were internet studies. So it was really clumsy. And we went to Burning Man and handed out surveys. We went to swingers conventions and handed out surveys. We went to places like this and handed out surveys. And it was um, focused on, um, the questions were focused on those that engaged in poly style dating. And so the swingers who just um, engaged others as as a couple at sex parties weren't included in managing this part of the data. And we ultimately generated a compersion index. And um, so we were trying to find out this. 
how poly people construct their social, emotional, and sexual lives, and explore the ways that they address and resolve jealousy, and look at what might predict how compulsive they could be. So basically, it's tough doing these kinds of things because you're just getting a snapshot. And the people who responded were basically already committed to polyamory. We didn't have my students' Facebook friends. And, um, and it was the most largely coherent to people who were open couples. So this, and being that this was done a while ago, our median age wasn't 37, but it was people born in the mid-50s. They were in their early to mid-40s then. <coughs> And these are how we measured compersion. Watching a part, if they could tolerate watching their partner with somebody else, if they could tolerate being watched by their partner while they were with somebody else, how they felt about their partner spending the whole night away, and what happens when their partner returns from a visit, and the impact of poly dating on a home relationship, and whether they'd like to change their relationship agreements. And so we created an 11 point scale for all of this. The median was super high and only 7.9% were less than seven. So it was really the norm for these people. So um, these are the main <coughs> conclusions. So their prior social, emotional and sexual independence did not preclude being able to do polyamory. And they thought, 70% of them thought that polyamory had increased their self-esteem and their love for their home partner. And nearly 90% reported that being poly had afforded a better perspective both on themselves and on their partners, as, the, as Kathy Labriola talked about. Um, so we had some really fun, statistically significant correlations. Um, men were more compersive than females. And they had more partners, less attachment, more of a sense of abundance. And you can even get a greater sense of abundance if you do Tinder. And um, I'm going to be talking about Tinder tomorrow. <laughs> so please come. It's a, an 11 o'clock-ish time. Um, it's on cyber chat, what I'm much more interested in these days. OK, so those who report um, that they love their lovers equally. So they're really embracing this whole notion that you can be equals and there isn't a, a one who's more than the other and making the other one feel less favorite. And hey, getting yourself off can help when you don't have your partner around or even when you do. So <coughs> how might they be actualizing compersion and negotiating jealousy? Um, more of an inner life. A busy life, lots of things going on, including an extended family of choice, being that poly people might be stigmatized and might not be all connected to their blood families. And believing in poly. I, I teach religion and anthropology. Belief is so important. So if you believe it, you can make it happen. And maybe they just really have high serotonin levels, higher than I do. And, um, their fears of loss are not actualized. Their new love did not replace or replace their partner. It all worked out. So I've noticed this thing that I called the polyamory blur, where um, basically to do polyamory right or to make it work, you have to um, limit NRE elevating experiences and reduce um, your emotional spectrum. If you're too spiky, you drive everybody crazy. <coughs> and you have to embrace compulsive thinking and, base, and, you know, and find this thing that's so hard for non-poly people to do, just to do it and to see value in it and have it be right. And one of the things I just eventually concluded, though it's really not the right audience to t admit this to, Polyamory may be serial monogamy in slow motion. So rather than having a really messy divorce, you just sort of slowly slip away by getting more and more connected to someone else. 
and or you do all this polyarmory stuff to try to <coughs> avoid anything that's going to challenge the whatever is else is going on. So, what are the real poly lessons? Boundaries. So, you need to respect a partner's needs to be connected to others and high intensity communication, things that are hard for many people to do. And ultimately, it could really be, and this was something that actually Deborah Annapol had suggested to me, that it was really at some level a dark night of the soul journey where you have to learn to be alone, you have to become self-nurturing, and have a positive self-identity independent from the presence ab or absence of lovers and partners. You're your own person. You're hot even if nobody is celebrating how hot you are. And, um, <laughs> and ultimately, which was a really hard one for me, release the desire to control others. Okay, that's it. Thank you.